Well, what a delight to be with you uh, this morning. I, I do uh, bring you greetings from Clifton Baptist. Uh, you know, thank you, Third Avenue, for being such a, a friend to Clifton. We know you pray for us, and we pray for you. We feel, we feel such a partnership uh, with you in the gospel. It is, it is a tremendous uh, joy to be partners with you in the gospel. And um, probably everybody says this but who's visiting, but don't take it for granted. Your, your singing is such an encouragement. So don't take that for granted. It's, it was so encouraging to worship and, and sing with you. So praise the Lord for this congregation and for you. So our sermon text today is Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21. I actually didn't check if you have pew Bibles. You probably do. But it's not going to be hard to find the page. I don't know what page it's on, but it's the last couple pages of the Bible. So, <laughs> you can probably find it somewhere in your Bible. Revelation chapter 21. We'll be looking at Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 through chapter 22 verse 5. I'll, I'll read that text shortly. But let's, let's pray before we begin. Our Father, we, we pray now that You'd come, that You would illumine our minds, inflame our hearts by Your Spirit, help us to recognize that this is not our Word, this is not my Word. This is your word that comes from outside of us and speaks to us truly and authoritatively. Strengthen us, challenge us, comfort us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what's the problem with Joel Osteen's phrase, your best life now? Well, the, the, the problem is the word now, right? We are going to have a best life. That, that phrase in one context is right, but it's our, our best life then, isn't it? That, that best life, it's, it's coming on the day of our resurrection. It's coming when Christ returns. That's what this passage before us, Revelation 21 and 22, teaches us. You know, we all know this. I know this very well. But we, we want that new creation now. We, we want, I want, I want that new heaven and earth now. We, we want, this is a very good church, but it's not a perfect church, right? We, we want that perfect church, which is why so many people in our culture, they church hop, don't they? They hop from church to church to church. Some do, at least looking for that perfect church. We want, we want heaven now, so there's, there's divorces, even, even among those who claim to be Christians, illegitimate divorces, di divorces not in accord with God's Word. We, we, want, we want perfect kids. So, so you know, that, that may manifest itself in overcorrecting them, being too strict, right? Maybe some of you experienced that. Or, 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 or not correcting them enough. Right? It, has, it has two different manifestations, one in that heaven now. Or, or we wish we had perfect parents. And perhaps some of you in here, you're struggling with the fact your parents weren't perfect. They, they hurt you and in, injured you. You know, I realize this as a parent. I damaged my kids in some ways with my sin. We, we, all, we all do. I, I recently read a book that was recommended, an author really, that was recommended by my family. They'd been recommending him for years. I, I listen to audiobooks a lot, but I'd never read any books by Wallace Stegner. So I asked my brother, which, which one should I read? And he said, read, read Big Rock Candy Mountain. Have you heard of that book? Big Rock Candy Mountain. You know, the Big Rock Candy Mountain, you can figure it out from the phrase, that that's really stands for, for heaven. That, that's what heaven is, really, this Big Rock Candy Mountain. 
And, and in, this, in this novel, uh, Bo and Elsa meet. She's 18 years old. She's young. She's naive. She's inexperienced. Bo's running a saloon. She's attracted to Bo. Her parents warn her, don't, don't, go, don't go for Bo. Bo. Bo, in a sense, stands for the world, doesn't he? It's not a Christian novel. But he does, in a sense, stand for the world. Bo is athletic. He's confident, he's charming, she marries him. Spoiler alert, you haven't read the novel. I see one person leaving. <laughs> he definitely wants to read this story, so that's okay. <laughs> hate, to, hate, hate to wreck novels for you. But they marry, they marry and it's a disaster. Bo always has this other new plan of how he's going to succeed, how he's going to make money, how he's going to prosper, how they're going to get rich, but he's really a failure. They're on, they're on, they're on the verge of ruin constantly. He, he gets involved in shady business deals. He, he, he ends up being an abusive father and really an abusive husband, when his wife is dying at the end, he's with another woman. This wife who has been incredibly devoted to him. You know, so to speak, as I said, it's not a Christian novel, but I couldn't help but reading it, to think of Elsa in a way represents the good, the good person who suffers so much at the hands of someone who is fundamentally evil. And, and, and that's the situation of the readers in the book of Revelation. They're being discriminated against. They're being persecuted. Yeah, a number of times we're told in the book, they're being put to death. The blood of the saints is being spilt. And, you know, we, we face that today, don't we? Anyone, anyone who looks at this world today recognizes that in our country today, there, there are Christians in every dimension, right? But in our country today, big tech, the universities, the media, they're, they're, they're not with us, are they? We, we think of, I'm not claiming he's a Christian, I don't know his faith, but we think of a couple years ago, right, a few years ago, Brandon Ike, chief technical officer for Mozilla, it became, it became known that he stood up for a, a biblical view of marriage for whatever reason, and he lost his job when it became known. That, that, that story's been rehearsed many times. That, that's the situation we see in this book. So John, John wants to encourage these believers to hang in there, to continue to follow Christ. So let's read our text today, and we see the end of the story. Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and he spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like 
a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured the wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were ordained, adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth ameth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river... The tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the heal healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord the God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. My sermon today really has just two, two themes, two, two points. For, we have a renewed creation. That's the first point. We have a renewed creation. And we have a, my, my second point is two things together. We have a heavenly city and a beautiful bride. So, so we have a renewed creation. And, and secondly, we have a heavenly city and a beautiful bride. You'll see why I put those two together. You know, we, we remember when we read these chapters that this, the vision is impressionistic, isn't it? The images here, they overlap, and they're interrelated. This is a particular kind of literature, isn't it? A, a, an apocalyptic book. It's, it's symbolic. What we have here is clearly symbolic. Maybe this sounds a little bit snarky, but C.S. Lewis said if somebody took this literally, they don't know how to read literature. Now, I think that's actually right, but, but here's, here's something I thought about. You know, even someone who takes it literally, at the end of the day, it has the same effect, doesn't it? So, you know, God, God uses this in various ways in people's lives. I think Lewis is right. This is symbolic. But even if you take it literally, it ends up really having the same message. But I think John is trying to describe the indescribable. I mean, how do we describe the future? Have you thought about what life will really be like in the new creation? Have you tried to picture it after you're, after you're gone, after you're with him? What will that really look like? I mean, what will it look like specifically? You know, we don't know very much, do we? It's, and, and why is it that we don't know very much? Because we're, we're trying to describe a realm of experience 
right, that is beyond us. I mean, how, how do you describe something like that? How do, how do you describe to someone else music that is so beautiful that you really can't, you can't put into words the ineffable experiences you had when you listened to that music? So I think, I think that's the kind of thing we see here. So let's, let's begin a renewed creation. We're promised, aren't we, a new heavens and a new earth. Verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And we see in verse 5, the Lord says, I am making, I'm making all things new. And then we read Isaiah 65. I want to remind you again of Isaiah 65, verse 17. I noticed tonight when you gather, you're you're reflecting on Isaiah 65, verse 19. But verse 17 says, clearly John's drawing on the Old Testament. That's one thing he does throughout the book, right? He draws on the Old Testament. Clearly John's drawing on this verse, Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, Isaiah says, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. Did you notice? Did you notice this in Revelation as well? That you have a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And you see that in Revelation 21 as well. You have a new heaven and a new earth, but also a new Jerusalem. There's a new creation coming. There's a new universe. There's a new heavens and a new earth. What will that new creation be like? Will God, will God destroy, annihilate, burn up this present world? Will He burn it up and then create a brand new one? Or, or secondly, will He purify and transform the universe and the world we're in now? Actually, in church history, Christians have disagreed about which is right. Both views are within the realm of orthodox teaching. You you can go way back. Christians have disagreed. Um, But I I lean towards the second, that that God is going to purify and transform this present world. So it's going to be this world transformed, renewed, so to speak. You know, I think we have a hint of that with the resurrection of the body. There's not complete discontinuity, right? We, our bodies are going to be raised from the dead, and a new creation is coming. Here's another thing that struck me about this new creation. I, what struck me is all the no mores in this text. Did you see that? The no mores. Let's, let's look at those. What are the no mores? No more sea, verse 1. Did you see that? No more sea. Well, wait a minute. I like water. <laughs> Do you? Wait a minute. Does that, is that good news? No more sea? I, I, I like the water. Well, the sea, see, here we come to the symbolism, right? Sea symbolizes chaos. You think in the Bible of the flood, right? You think of the chaos of those waters surging and destroying. You, you remember in, in Revelation 13, the beast comes out of the sea. Satan stands on the shore and he calls that beast out of the sea. We remember in Revelation, I mean, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, there's, the earth is form and void, and there's waters seemingly untamed. So I don't think he's saying that there won't be a sea literally, especially if we have a transformation of this creation. What is he saying? No more hurricanes. No more, no more tornadoes. No, no more tsunamis. No more no more typhoons, no, no more floods, no more, no more earthquakes. But so to speak, every day is like, if you've had the joy and privilege as, as I have had of being in Hawaii, every day is 75 degrees, sunny, fresh breezes, beautiful, no more of the chaos and evil of the old creation. And then we see in verse 4, no more pain. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. 
because the previous things have passed away. Remember what Isaiah said? The previous things, the things that bring pain, maybe even today, you won't remember them anymore. Even if that's a symbol, you won't remember them with pain anymore. Every tear, every pain will be removed by Him. He wipes it away as our, as our loving God. You know, one, one of the joys of being a parent, one of the things I loved most when our kids were small, when, when, they, when they were in pain and crying, you know, you, you know this as parents, right? What a, what a joy it is to comfort your children when they're in pain. What a joy it is to wipe tears from their eyes. A, 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 a little experience, right, of, of God's great love for us as, since his parents were imperfect. But we're reminded this life is full of tears. And as I said, maybe, maybe you're going through that right now. If you're not going through it right now, you have, and doubtless you will. Perhaps, perhaps you're at a place where you break down crying often. You know, there's the wrenching pain of an unfaithful husband or an unfaithful wife or an unloving spouse, or there's the tears that flow when you have a son or a daughter and they're ruining their life, or the pain that comes from a mom or a dad, and they weren't there for you, and maybe they're not there for you now, or the grief that comes just from a relationship that fails, or, or the disappointment that comes from not being respected, or, or, or maybe it's the pain of, a, of, of physical disease of some kind or ailment that's, that's pretty unrelenting. You're reminded every day of your brokenness. Or for some, not all who are single, right? But for some, a disappointment of not being able to be married. Or if you're married, not being able to have children. And it's hard to exaggerate the horror of death. We, we spent Friday night with a friend who's in a dire situation. It doesn't look good for him, a beloved and dear friend. And I, I'm reminded of what David says, oh, that I had the wings of a dove to fly away. Do you ever feel that way? Oh, that I had the wings of, of a dove to fly away. Whatever you're going through, I want to get away from all this. Because death, it severs us mercilessly from those we love. No more mom, no more dad or daughter or husband or wife or brother or sister. Never see them again. My wife almost died in 2012 in an accident, and I'll never forget going home that first night, walking into my bedroom and realizing I may never see her again, and a desolate feeling just swept over me. I mean, praise God, she's right here. Thankfully, God is good. He doesn't always answer prayers that way. But death is desolating. And it can seem like, all these things I talked about, it can seem like those things are the final reality. They're the ultimate reality. But this text tells us, doesn't it, the final reality isn't sorrow and pain, but joy and everlasting. We're not going to remember those things. That pain will be gone. The final word for Christians, right? Not for unbelievers. The final word for Christians isn't death, but life. The fear of death, Hebrews says. The fear of death rules over our lives, our entire lives, but Christ, He's freed us from the fear of death. And you know, I saw that with my friend Friday night. Because he has, unless the Lord works a miracle, a death sentence hanging over him in the next year, probably. But he was full of joy. That doesn't mean it's not hard. It's hard. It's hard on him. It's hard on the family. But I saw 
the joy of Christ in him. As death draws near, we have objective grounds for hope. That's what this text is saying. And I think here's, here's what uh, the purpose of this text for us, and I think it's expressed in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Here's what we should pray. May the God of hope, may the God who gives hope, because that's what we need, right, to make it in life. We need hope. May the God of hope fill you now with all joy and peace. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How? In believing, in trusting, right? In trusting these great promises so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, God wants us to be now in a world of suffering and pain filled with hope. And, how does, and that hope comes as we believe. Right? Joy and peace, where does it come from? In believing, in believing these great promises. So, no more tears, and then no more loss. The nations will walk, this is verse 24 of Revelation 21, the nations will walk by the light of the holy city. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. What does that symbolize? I think John is asking here, will the future be better than the present? And I think he's saying everything you treasure in this world, everything you delight in, it will be in the new creation in a higher and a better way. The nations bring their glory into the city. Well, what is that? I think John is saying, now yeah, there's no marriage, but there's something better. The trees, the oceans, the beaches, the mountains, whatever you delight in, architecture, beautiful music, sports, whatever you love, it will be in the new creation and, and escalated 10,000 times. I've told this story many times. Some of you may have heard it. But when our daughter, Anna, who was recently a member of this church, but when our daughter, Anna, was small, she really loved our dog, Scamper. She loved him with a very fierce love. And she told me that she shared the gospel with Scamper. <laughs> So, and then she said to me one day, will Scamper be in heaven? And I don't know, she was five or six. I don't know how old she was, but young. And I said to her, Anna, do you really need to have Scamper with you in heaven to be happy? So I'm talking to a five or six-year-old, right? I'm not getting a full theology lesson. <laughs> and she said, yes, Dad, I absolutely need him. And then I said, then he'll be there. Then he'll be there. Because I think that's what this text is saying. You know, we grow and expand as we grow older, right? But everything we delight in in this world, it will be there in a new and transformed way in the new creation. No more night. Chapter 22, verse 5, there's no night there. I love that text. I just love that little phrase, do you? There's no night there. Do you remember John 13, when Jesus is at table with his disciples, and Judas decides to betray him? Remember what John tells us? John 13, I think it's verse 30. He tells us when Judas went out to betray Jesus, and it was night. And it was night. Evil was reigning, but there'll be no more night. No murders in the dark, no stabbings in the back, literally or metaphorically, no robberies, no wars and corruption, no, no abuse, no, no adultery, no, no more strife over masks or politics or, or even over theology. That'll be all over, won't it? No more Vladimir Putin who rules in Russia with his corruption and assassinates his rivals. No more Xi Jinping and China 
persecuting and killing the Uyghurs who are made in the image of God? No more persecution of Christians in Afghanistan or anywhere else. We also read, no more disease and death and no more curse. Chapter 22, verse 3. I mean chapter 22, verse 2 and 3. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. So John takes us back to the early chapters of Genesis, right? The curse came because human beings ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the the curse came on human beings. Instead of enjoying the tree of life, death came because of sin. But in the new creation, there's a tree of life, and it brings healing to the nations. Look, that doesn't mean people get sick in the new creations, right? This is imagery. That doesn't mean anybody gets sick and needs to get well when you're in the new creation. No one gets sick in the new creation. It's a picture, right? It's a picture of not being sick anymore, of complete health and healing. It's a symbol What a beautiful picture it is of God's healing power in Christ, the removal of the curse of sin and death. Sin is like a disease. It twists us and deforms us and defaces us and it kills us. Now, the disease analogy isn't perfect, is it? Because diseases come from outside of us, so to speak, right? I mean, we chose to sin, all of us. If you're an unbeliever here, right? Everybody in this room came into the world as a sinner, and you came into the world as a sinner. We're all sinners. We all fall short. And sin, sin why is the world the way it is? Because of sin. And it, and, it, and it defaces and destroys us and deforms us. We're all sick with sin, so to speak. But Jesus Christ, there's a tree of life, right? Jesus Christ died on a tree so that we can be healed. So that if we put our trust in Him, if we turn away from sin, if we rest in Him, we're healed from that disease of sin and we have new life in Christ. And if you're not a believer today and you came with a friend, I know they'd love to talk to you or a pastor. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm a visitor, right? But I know many would love to talk to you about that today. But we read here there's the death of death in the death of Christ. I think we sang that in one of our songs today, didn't we? And what does this text say? It says, if you drink of that water of life. What do you have to do? You just have to drink. You have to be humble enough just to drink, to say, I need you. I want you. I give myself to you. And it's free. What an amazing and wonderful gift. No more curse. That brings me to the second point. We have a heavenly city, and we have a beautiful bride. Don't worry, this point isn't as long, although I have no idea how long I've been speaking. (laughs) That's kind of a scary admission. But both of those themes are brought together. Here's chapter 21, verse 2. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Did you see something? The new Jerusalem is the holy city, but it's prepared like a bride. Do you see that together? It's the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and the bride together. We see this again in verse 9 of chapter 21. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he says, I'm going to show you the bride. But if you paid attention when you were reading the rest of the text, then he talks about the city, doesn't he? I'm I'm going to tell you about the bride, but he tells you about the city. So they're brought together, right? The heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and, and the bride are brought together in the text. It's both. So, I see, I see three, three sub-themes here. First of all, um, 
we see the unity of the church. I mean, we could talk about a lot of things, but I see the unity of the church. Jesus prays in John 17 that the church should be one. And we see in verses 12 through 14, right, you, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, their names are on the gates. And the 12 apostles, their names are on the foundations. So, so what is he saying? Right, the foundation of the church, Ephesians 2.20, the foundation of the church is the, the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. But, but the, the name of Israel is on the, on the gates. We have one people of God. We're a united people of God, and that will be fulfilled perfectly in the new creation that is coming. No more, no more battles you know, there's a place for disagreement. I, I agree with this, a, a, a healthy, good disagreement, but not the kind of battles that fracture and divide us that we see Christians even engaging in, yeah, in person, but in social media. They're very common today. We'll be united. There'll be perfect love and perfect truth as all hold to the apostolic gospel. And, and then... And then secondly, we see in the city the presence, the presence of God. You know, have you, have you ever had the excitement? I, can, I grew up out in the country. Have you ever had the excitement for the first time of going to a large city? Uh, I was in my 20s the first time I, I went to San Francisco, and I came over the Bay Bridge, and it was one of those beautiful, cloudless days and I was just so struck with the amazing beauty of San Francisco. Or I think of the first time I went to Manhattan, and I was in awe at the, all the skyscrapers in the city. Well, what makes this city so enchanting, so alluring, and so delightful? John tells us, doesn't he? Chapter 22, verse 3, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. What makes the city, city so radiant and lovely and beautiful? What do we really look forward to? Why, well, it's, it's God Himself, isn't it? That's what he's saying. It's God's, it's God's presence. That's what makes the city so delightful and so enthralling. He says in chapter 21, verse 22 and 23, I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. I don't think this text is saying there is no sun, right, or moon. I mean, we, I don't know. We'll find out. He says there's no need of it. That, that's, that's a different thing, isn't it? I mean, maybe there isn't a sun or moon. We'll find out. But he says there's no need of the sun or moon because what illumines the city is, is God and the Lamb. And did you notice they're brought together? Equal in stature, equal in dignity. God and the Lamb together. The, the, the whole city, the whole city is God's temple. God dwells in this city. It's His temple. So it's a new Jerusalem, but it's also, it's also His temple, His dwelling place where God, where God resides. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40 through 48 talks all about the rebuilding of a temple. We don't have time to look at those chapters, but I just want you to know, John alludes to those chapters again and again and again in these verses, which I think he's telling us that picture of the temple that Ezekiel is talking about, that picture is fulfilled not, I would argue, not in a temple built on this earth, but in the new creation. And, 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 and actually, the fulfillment is beyond our imagination because there's not a literal temple. The temple now is the whole universe, and God dwells in it. So Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 40 through 48, is trying to describe the indescribable for us. We read in verse 16, the city 
we're continuing this theme. The city is laid out square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia, its length, its width, and its height are equal. Well, what, why does that matter? First of all, I want to say, I think the number 12 is symbolic in Revelation. And then 12 times 1,000 is symbolic. The city is like a perfect cube. What does that remind us of in the Old Testament? The most holy place. We are told in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 20, that in the most holy place, it's 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high. It's a perfect cube. He's telling us again, the city's like a temple. The city, what I'm suggesting is, the city's the whole universe. We read in verse 11, the city of chapter 21, is a, the city is arrayed with God's glory. It has these beautiful stones on its foundation. So, John is telling us something beautiful awaits us. It's like, it's like an upcoming wedding. It's like anticipating the birth of a child. It's like, it's like the homecoming of a of a child. It's like a stunning vacation, unrivaled in its beauty. And so, what is John saying to the church that's being persecuted, discriminated against, suffering? He's saying to them, hang in there. Hang in there. Don't, don't give up. You know, you, you give up on a diet, if you're on a diet, you give up, well, for probably for a number of reasons, but one reason people give up is you begin to say, it's, it's of no use. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not helping. What's the use? And, and, and I think, again, it's complex for many reasons. Why, why do people start looking at pornography? They, they're discouraged, one reason. They get discouraged for various reasons. They're down. They want to lift themselves up a little bit. Discouragement and, and being down. It, it can lead us easily into sin, right? And John wants to remind a, a church that is prone to discouragement, hang in there. There's something great coming. And if you know there's something great coming, you can hang in there. You can make it. And then finally, the city's safe and secure. Verse 12 of chapter 21, the city had a massive high wall. You know, in that day, cities had walls to protect them, right? That doesn't work today, does it? High walls don't matter. We have, we have bombs and planes. But in those days, a high wall protected the city. That's what it symbolized. The, the city has 12 gates and has angels at the gates. What's that stand for? You're not getting by those angels, right? It's protection. The angel, verse 15, the angel had a golden rod measuring the city. Well, you, well, you can look back in the Old Testament. Look at Zechariah. We don't have time to look at it. But measuring the city stands for what? The city's measured out and it's protected. It's safe. So he's telling us this over and over again. Yeah, in 2116, the city is 12,000 stadia. That is 15. 1,500 miles. The city is 1,500 miles high. Now, I'm not taking that literally. Some people do. Okay, whatever. You, you decide what you think. But I think that's just a picture. This is a massive city. It's 1,500 miles high and wide and long. It fills the whole universe. Verse 25 what does it say? Its gates will never close by day. Look, look, there's no use, there's no use, <laughs> there's no use having a high wall if you leave the gates open, right? That defeats the purpose. But it's just another picture, isn't it? The, the city's completely safe. The, you can leave your house unlocked, so to speak. Nothing evil will enter this city. Everything we fear, everything we dread, everything that may hang over us like Damocles' sword, 
whether, whether you fear death or, or rejection or, or, or loneliness or, or just being forgotten or feeling useless, whatever, whatever we fear in our lives, we're going to be safe. Safety is coming. He, God protects us now, doesn't he? He strengthens us now. Obviously, he does. And he, and he motivates us here. Stay, stay with Jesus. So, I close by saying that big rock, Candy Mountain, it's coming, right? It's coming. But what makes it so wonderful are, are not the gifts God gives us, but finally, but finally, God himself. It, it reminded me, I just closed with this thought. It reminded me when I was, we were first married and, and we, we'd, we'd come home to see my parents. And I, I, I'll never forget just how excited I was to come home with Diane and see my parents again. What, how thrilling and exciting it was and how I looked forward to that. And what a joy it was to see them again. And, but we look forward to a greater home, don't we? We, we, have, we have a future that nothing can touch. We're, we're, we're going to be safe. We're going to be secure. And we're going to dwell with our God forever and ever. Let's pray. Our Father, we do give you thanks for these great promises. We know we are weak. We easily forget these promises. Thank you for putting them in your word to remind us. And Lord, encourage our hearts. Strengthen us. Lord, give us hope. May we experience even now joy and peace in believing these great promises. We pray that you would work that in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.